Section 22 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 22, Blay. Ambrose of Mathon and his meek and humble follower rested at Chalons on their way to Paris. For many weeks they had begged from door to door, sleeping in some hermit's cell or by the roadside when the severity of the bitter nights permitted occasionally finding shelter in a wayside convent so patient so courageous before hardship so truly sad and remorseful so grateful for the distant chance of ultimate pardon was dirk that the saint grew to love the penitent vagabond no one eager to look for it could have found any fault with his behavior he was gentle as a girl obedient as a servant rigid in his prayers and he had a strangely complete knowledge of the offices and penances of the church silent and sorrowful often taking no pleasure in anything save the saints talk of paradise and holy things particularly he loved to hear of the dead youth blay of his saintly life of his desire to join the stern brotherhood of the sacred heart in paris of his fame as one beloved of god of the convent's wish to receive him of his great learning of his beautiful death in the snowy evening to all this dirk listened with still attention and from st ambrose's rapt and loving recital he gathered little earthly details of the subject of their speech such as that he was from flanders of a noble family that his immediate relatives were dead that his years were no more than twenty and that he was dark and pale for himself dirk had little to say he described simply his shame and remorse after he had stolen the holy gold his gradual sickening of his companions the long torture of his awakening soul his attempts to find the saint and how finally after he had resolved to flee his evil life and enter a convent he had run out of frankfurt found a boat waiting and so drifted to st ambrose's feet the saint rejoicing in his penitence suggested that he should enter the convent whither they journeyed with the tidings of the holy youth's death and dirk consented with humble gratitude and so they passed through chalons and rested in a deserted hut overlooking the waters of the marne having finished their scanty meal they were seated together under the rough shelter the luxury of a fire was denied their austerity a cold wind blew in and out of the ill-built doors and a colourless light filled the mean bare place dirk sat on a wooden stool reading aloud the writings of st jerome he wore a coarse brown robe very different from his usual attire fastened round the waist with a rope into which was twisted a wooden rosary his feet were encased in rude leather boots his hands reddened with the cold his face hollow and of a bluish pallor in which his eyes shone feverishly large and dark his smooth hair hung on to his shoulders he stooped in contrast with his usual erect carriage pausing on his low and gentle reading he looked across at the saint ambrose of Mathon sat on a rough-hewn bench against the rougher wall weariness exposure and sheer weakness of body had done their work at last dirk knew that for three nights he had not slept he was asleep now or had swooned his fair head fell forward on his breast his hands hung by his side as dirk became assured that his companion was unconscious he slowly rose and set down the holy volume he was himself half starved cold to the heart and shuddering he looked round the plaster walls and the meek expression of his face changed to one of scorn derision and wicked disdain he darted a bitter glance at the wan man and crept towards the door opening it softly he gazed out the scene was fair and lonely the distant tourelle of chalons rose clear and pointed against the winter clouds near by the grey river flowed between its high banks 
where the bare willows grew and the snow wreaths lay dirk took shivering steps into the open and turned towards the marne the keen wind penetrated his poor garments and lifted the heavy hair from his thin cheeks he beat his breast chaffed his hands and walked rapidly reaching the bank he looked up and down the river there was no one in sight neither boat nor animal nor house to break the monotony of land sky and water only those distant towers of the town dirk walked among the twisted willows then came to a pause a little ahead of him were a black man and a black dog both seated on the bank and gazing towards chalons the youth came a little nearer good even he said it is very cold the blackamoor looked round are you pleased with the way you travel he asked nodding his head and your companion dirk's face lowered how much longer am i to endure it you must have patience said the black man and endurance i have both answered dirk look at my hands they are no longer soft but red and hard my feet are galled and wounded in rough boots i must walk till i am sick then pray instead of sleeping i see no fire and scarcely do i touch food you will be rewarded and revenged too oh ho oh, oh it is very cold as you say very cold what must i do asked dirk the black man rubbed his hands together you know you know dirk's pinched wan face grew intent and eager am i to use this he touched the breast of his rough habit yea then shall i be left defenceless dirk's voice shook a little if anything should happen i would not i could not o oh, satanas i could not be revealed the blackamoor rose from among the willows do you trust yourself and me he asked dirk put his thin hand over his eyes yea master then you know what to do you will not see me for many years when you have triumphed i shall come he turned swiftly and ran down the bank the hound at his heels one after another they leapt into the waters of the marne and disappeared with an inner sound dirk straightened himself and set his lips he re-entered the hut to find ambrose of Mathon still against the wall now indeed wearily asleep dirk came softly forward slowly and cautiously he put his hand into his bosom and drew out a small green-coloured vial with his eyes keenly on the saint he broke the seal then crept close by saint ambrose's side hung his rosary every bead smooth with the constant pressure of his lips dirk raised the heavy crucifix attached and poured on to it the precious drop contained in the vial st ambrose did not wake nor move dirk drew away and crouched against the wall cursing the bitter wind with fierce eyes when the saint awoke dirk was on the broken stool reading aloud the writings of st jerome is it still light asked ambrose of mathon amazedly it is the dawn answered dirk and i have slept the night through the saint dragged his stiff limbs from the seat and fell on his knees in a misery of prayer dirk closed the book and watched him watched his long fingers twining in the beads of his rosary watched him kiss the crucifix again and again then he too knelt his face hidden in his hands he was the first to rise master shall we press on to paris he asked humbly the saint lifted dazed eyes from his devotions yea he said yea dirk began putting together in a bundle their few books and the wooden platter in which they collected their broken food this being their all i dreamt last night of paradise said saint ambrose faintly the floor was so thick strewn with close little flowers red white and purple and it was warm as italy in may dirk swung the bundle on to his shoulder and opened the door of the hut they passed out into the dreary landscape 
and took their slow way along the banks of the Marne. Until midday they did not pause, scarcely spoke. Then they passed through a little village, and the charitable gave them food. That night they slept in the open, under shelter of a hedge, and Ambrose of Mathon complained of weakness. Dirk, waking in the dark, heard him praying, heard, too, the rattle of the wooden rosary. When the light came and they once more recommenced their journey, the saint was so feeble he was fain to lean on Dirk's shoulder. "'I think I am dying,' he said. His face was flushed, his eyes burning. He smiled continuously. "'Let me reach Paris,' he added, "'that I may tell the brethren of Blay." The youth supporting him wept bitterly. Towards noon they met a woodsman's cart that helped them on their way. That night they spent in the stable of an inn. The next day they descended into the valley of the Seine, and by the evening reached the gates of Paris. As the bells all over the beautiful city were ringing to vespers, they arrived at their destination, an old and magnificent convent, surrounded with great gardens set near the river bank. The monks were singing the Magnificat. Their thin voices came clearly on the frosty air. Facit potentiam in brachio suo, dispersit subos mente cordisu. Ambrose of Mathon took his feeble hand from Dirk's arm and sank on his knees. Deposuit potentes de sede, et excaltavit humilies. But Dirk's pale lips curled, and he gazed at the sun flaming beyond the convent walls. There was a haughty challenge in his brooding eyes. Esurientes implevit bones, et divites simisit inenes, susepit Israel puerum sum, Recordatus misericordiae sue. The saint murmured the chanted words and clasped his hands on his breast, while the sun brightened vividly above the wild waters of the sign. Sicud locutus e ad patre notros, Abraham et semini eus en secula. The chant faded away on the still evening, but the saint remained kneeling. Master, whispered Dirk, shall we not go in to them? Ambrose of Mathon raised his fair face. I am dying, he smiled. A keen flame licks up my blood and burns my heart to ashes. Sustinut anime me in verbo uius. His voice failed. He sank forward, and his head fell against the grey beds of rue and fennel. Alas! alas! cried Dirk. He made no attempt to bring assistance, nor called aloud, but stood still gazing with intent eyes at the unconscious man. But when the monks came out of the chapel and turned two by two towards the convent, Dirk pulled off his worn cap. Divinim, oxilum, mancat semper nobiscum. Amen, said Dirk. Then he ran lightly forward and flung himself before the procession. My father, he cried with a sob in his voice. The priest stopped, the amens still trembling on their lips. Ambrose of Menthon lies within your gates, a dying man, said Dirk meekly and sadly. With little exclamations of awe and grief, the grey-clad figures followed him to where the saint lay. He has done with his body, said an old monk, holding up the dying man. The flushed sky faded behind them. The saint stirred and half opened his eyes. Blay, he whispered. Blay. He tried to point to Dirk, who knelt at his feet. He will tell you. His eyes closed again. He strove to pray. The de profundis trembled on his lips. He made a sudden upward gesture with his hands, smiled, and died. For a while there was silence among them, 
broken only by a short sob from Dirk. Then the monks turned to the ragged, emaciated youth who crouched at the dead feet. Dirk roused himself as if from a silent prayer, made the sign of the cross, and rose. "'Who art thou?' they asked reverently. "'The youth, Blay, my fathers,' he answered humbly. End of section 22 Recording by Molly Craig Section 23 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. The Pope. Chapter 1. Cardinal Luigi Capriola. The evening service in the Basilica of St. Peter was over. Pilgrims, peasants, and monks had departed. The last chant of the officiating cardinal's train still trembled on the incense-filled air when a man richly and fantastically dressed entered the bronze door and advanced a little way down the center aisle he bent his head to the altar then paused and looked about him with the air of a stranger he was well used to magnificence but this first sight of the chapel of the vatican caused him to catch his breath to one side of the high altar stood a purple chair and a purple footstool the seat of the cardinal sometimes of the pontiff this splendid and holy beauty abashed yet inspired the stranger he leant against one of the smooth columns and gazed at the altar the novices were putting out the candles and preparing to close the church their swift feet made no sound silently the little stars about the high altar disappeared and deeper shadows fell over the aisles the stranger watched the white figures moving to and fro until no light remained, save the purple and scarlet lamps that cast rich rays over the gold and stained the pure lilies into color. Then he left his place and went slowly towards the door. Already the bronze gates had been closed. Only the entrance to the Vatican and one leading into a side street remained open several monks issued from the chapels and left by this last the stranger still lingered down from the altar came the two novices prostrated themselves then proceeded along the body of the church they extinguished the candles in the candelabra set down the aisles and a bejeweled darkness fell on the basilica the stranger stood under a malachite and platinum shrine that blinded with the glimmer and sparkle of golden mosaic. Before it burnt graduated tapers. One of the novices came towards it, and the man waiting there moved towards him. Sir, he said in a low voice, may I speak to you? He spoke in Latin, with the accent of a scholar, and his tone was deep and pleasant. The novice paused and looked at him, gazed intently, and beheld a very splendid person, a man in the prime of life, tall above the ordinary, and above the ordinary, gorgeous to the eyes. His face was sunburnt to a hue nearly as dark as his light bronze hair, and his western eyes showed clearly bright and pale in contrast. In his ears hung long pearl and gold ornaments that touched his shoulders. His dress was half eastern, of fine violet silk and embroidered leather. He carried in his belt a curved scimitar inset with turkis. By his side a short gold sword, and against his hip he held a purple cap ornamented with a plume of peacock's feathers, and wore long gloves fretted in the palm with the use of rein and sword. But more than these details did the stranger's face strike the novice, a face almost as perfect as the marks of the gods found in the temples. The rounded and curved features were over full for a man, and the expression was too indifferent, troubled, almost weak to be attractive, but taken in itself the face was notably beautiful. Noting the novice's intent gaze, a flush crept into the man's dark cheek. I am a stranger, he said. I want to ask you of Cardinal Capriola. He officiated here today? Yea, answered the novice. What can I tell you of him? He is the greatest man in Rome. Now his holiness is dying, 
he added. Why, I have heard of him, even in Constantinople. I think I saw him, many years ago, before I went to the East. It may be, sir, he said. His eminence was a poor youth, as I might be. He came from Flanders. It was in Courtraig I thought I saw him. I know not if he was ever there. He became a disciple of St. Ambrose of Menthon when very young, and after the saint's death he joined the convent of the Sacred Heart in Paris. You have heard of that, sir? I have heard nothing. I have been away many years. This man, Cardinal Capriola, he is a saint also, is he not? Tell me more of him. Born of Dendermonde he was, sir, Louis, his name. In our tongue, Luigi. Blay, the name he took in the convent. He came to Rome, seven, nay, it must be eight years ago. His holiness created him bishop of Ostia, then of Capriola, which last name he retains now he is cardinal. He is the greatest man in Rome, repeated the novice. And a saint, asked the other with a wistful eagerness. Certes, when he was a youth he was famous for his holy, austere life. Now he lives in magnificence as befits a prince of the church. He is very holy. There was a great service here today, the stranger asked. Yea, very many pilgrims were here. I grieve that I was too late. Think you Cardinal Capriola would see one unknown to him? If the errand warranted it, sir. I seek peace. If it be anywhere, it is in the hands of this servant of God. My soul is sick. Will he help me heal it? Yea, I do think so. The youth turned as he spoke, towards the little side door. I must close the basilica, sir, he added. The stranger seemed to rouse himself from depths of unhappy thoughts, and followed through the quivering gloom. Where should I find the cardinal? he asked. His palace lies in the Via de San Giovanni, in La Tirano. Any will tell you the way, sir. The novice opened the door. God be with you. And with you. The stranger stepped into the open, and the church door was locked behind him. The purple afterglow still lingered over Rome. It was May and sweetly warm. As the stranger crossed the piazza of St. Peter, the breeze was like the touch of silk on his face. He walked slowly, and presently hesitated, looked round the ruined temples, broken palace and walls. There were people about, not many, mostly monks. He turned toward the arch of Titus. The ladies laughed and stared as he passed. One took a flower from her hair and threw it after him, at which he frowned, blushed, and hastened on. He had never been equal to the admiration he roused in women, though he disliked neither them nor their admiration. He carried still on his wrist the mark of a knife left there by a Byzantine princess who had found his face fair and his wooing cold. Passing the fountain of Meta Sudans and the remains of the Flavian amphitheatre, he gained the Via de San Giovanni in Letterano leading to the Calamontana gate. Here he drew a little apart from the crowd and looked about him. In the distance, the Vatican and the Castel San Angelo showed faintly against the remote Apiennes. He could distinguish the banner of the emperor hanging slackly in the warm air, the little lights in St. Peter's. A few moments brought him to the magnificent gates of the Villa Capriola. They stood open upon a garden of flowers, just gleamingly visible in the dusk. The stranger hesitated in the entrance, fixing his gaze on the luminous white walls of the palace that showed between the boughs of Citron and Cyprus. This cardinal, this prince, who was the greatest man in Rome, which was to say in Christendom, had strangely captured his imagination. He liked to think of him as an obscure and saintly youth devoting his life to the service of God, rising by no arts or intrigues, but by the pure will of his master, 
solely until he dominated the great empire of the West. The stranger, now at his beautiful gates, had been searching for peace for many years, in many lands, and always in vain. In Constantinople he had heard of the holy Frankish priest, who was already a greater power than the old and slowly dying Pope, and it had comforted his tired heart to think that there was one man in a high place set there by God alone, one, too, of a pure life and noble soul, if any could give him promise of salvation, if any could help him to redeem his wasted, weak life, it would be he, this cardinal, who could not know evil save as a name. With this object he came to Rome. He wished to lay his sins and penitence at the feet of him who had been a meek and poor novice, and now by his virtues was Luigi Capriola, as mighty as the emperor, and as innocent as the angels. Shame and awe for a while held him irresolute. How could he dare relate his miserable and horrible story to this saint? But God had bidden him, and the holy were always merciful. He walked slowly between the dim flowers and bushes to the stately columned portico. With a thickly beating heart and a humble carriage, he mounted the low, wide steps and stood at the cardinal's door which should open on a marble vestibule dimly lit with a soft roseate violet color. Two huge negroes wearing silver collars and tiger skins were on guard at each column of the door, and as the newcomer set foot within the portals, one of them struck the silver bell attached to his wrist. Instantly appeared a slim and gorgeous youth, habited in black, a purple flower fastened at his throat. The stranger took off his cap. This is the residence of his eminence, Cardinal Capriola, he asked, and the hint of hesitation always in his manner was accentuated. Yea, the youth bowed gracefully. I am his eminence's secretary, Messer Paolo Orsini. I do desire to see the cardinal. What is your purpose, sir? One neither political nor worldly, he paused flushed then added i would confess to his eminence i have come from constantinople for that for that alone the cardinal hears confession in the basilica certes i know yet i would crave to see him privately i have matters relating to my soul to put before him surely he will not refuse me the stranger's voice was unequal his bearing troubled as the secretary curiously observed, penitents, anxious for their souls, did not often trouble the cardinal, but Orsini's aristocratic manner showed no surprise. His eminence, he said, is ever loath to refuse himself to the faithful. I will ask him if he will give you audience. What, sir, is your quality and your name? I am unknown here, answered the other humbly. Lately I have come from Constantinople where I held an office at the court of Baal, but by birth I am a Frank of the cardinal's own country. Sir, your name, repeated the elegant secretary. I have been known by many, but let his eminence have the truth. I am Thierry, born of Dendermonde. Paolo Orsini bowed again. I will acquaint the cardinal, he said. Will you await me here? He was gone, as swiftly and silently as he had come. Thierry, hand to brow, gazed about him. He had seen nothing more lavishly splendid in the East. Cardinal Capriola was no ascetic, whatever the youth blade may have been. And for a moment Thierry was bewildered and disappointed. Could a saint live thus? Then he reflected. Good it was to consider that God, and not the devil, who so often used beauty and wealth for his lures, had given a man this. He walked up and down, none to watch him but the four silent and motionless negroes. The exquisite lights, the melody of the fountain, the sweet odors that rose from the slow, curling blue vapors, the gorgeous surroundings, lulled and soothed. He felt that at last, 
after his changeful wanderings his restless unhappiness he had found his goal and his haven in this man's hands was redemption this man was housed as befitted an ambassador of the lord of heaven paolo orsini in person as rare and splendid as the palace returned the cardinal will receive you sir he said if the message astonished him he did not show it he bowed before thierry and preceded him up the magnificent stairs paolo orsini opened a gilt door and held it wide while thierry entered then he bowed himself away saying his eminence will be with you presently thierry found himself in a fair-sized chamber walls floor and ceiling composed of ebony and mother-of-pearl incense burnt in a gold brazier the rich scent of it glowing almost insupportable in the close confined space the dim blue light the strong perfumes were confusing to the senses his pulses throbbed his heart leapt it did not seem as if he could speak to the cardinal then it seemed as if he could tell him everything and leave absolved yet and yet what was there in the place reviving memories that had been thrust deep into his heart for years a certain room in an old house in antwerp with the august sunlight over the figure of a young man gilding a devil a chamber in the college at Baal, and two youths bending over a witch's fire a dark wet night and the sound of a weak voice coming to him frankfurt and a garden blazing with crimson roses other scenes crowded horrible why did he think of them here in this remote land among strangers here where he had come to purge his soul there was a shiver of silks and the cardinal stepped into the chamber thierry sank on his knees and bowed his throbbing head the cardinal slowly closed the door a low rumble of thunder sounded a great storm was gathering over the Tyrrhenian Sea. End of section 23. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 24 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Chapter 2. The Confession. In nomine patris e fili et spiritus sancti. I give you greeting, said the cardinal, in a low, grave voice. He crossed to the ivory chair and seated himself. Thierry lifted his head and looked eagerly at the man who he hoped would be his savior. The cardinal was young, of the middle height, of a full but elegant person, and conveying an impression of slightness and delicacy, though he was, in reality, neither small nor fragile. His face was pale, by this light only dimly to be seen. He wore a robe of vivid pink and violet silk that spread about the step on which his chair was placed. His hands were very beautiful and ornamented with a variety of costly rings. On his head was a black skull cap, and outside it his hair showed thick, curling, and of a chestnut red color. His foot, very small and well shaped, encased in a gold slipper showed beneath his gown he caught hold of the ivory arms of his seat and looked straight at thierry with intense dark eyes on what matters did you wish to speak with me he asked thierry could not find words a choking sense of horror of something dreadful and blasphemous beyond all words clutched at his heart he stared at the young cardinal he must be going mad the air, the incense makes me giddy, holy father, he murmured. The cardinal touched a bell and motioned to Thierry to rise. A beautiful boy in a white tunic answered the summons. Extinguish the incense, said the cardinal, and open the windows, Gian. It is very hot. A storm gathers, does it not? The youth drew apart the painted curtains and unlatched the window. As the cooler air was wafted into the close chamber, Thierry breathed more freely. "'The stars are all hidden, your eminence,' said Gian, looking at the night. "'Certainly it is a storm.' He raised the brazier, 
shook out the incense, leaving it smouldering greyly, went on one knee to the cardinal, then withdrew backwards. As the door closed behind him, Luigi Capriola turned to the man standing humbly before him. "'Now you can speak?' he said gravely. Thierry flushed. "'Scarcely have I the heart. Your eminence abashes me. I have a sickening tale to relate. Hearing of you, I thought, this holy man can give me peace. And I came half across the world to lay my troubles at your feet. But now, sir, now, I fear to speak. Indeed, am scarce able. Unreal and hideous it seems in this place. In brief, sir, said the cardinal, ye have changed your mind. I think ye were ever of a changeful disposition, Thierry of Dendermonde. How does your eminence know that of me? It is, alas, true. I see it in your face, answered the cardinal, and something else I see. You are, and long have been, unhappy. It is my great unhappiness that has brought me before your eminence. Weary of sin and afraid of heaven, ye have come to seek absolution of me, said the cardinal. Yea, if it might be granted me, if by any penitence I might obtain pardon. Then Thierry, whose gaze was fixed on the ground as he spoke, had an extraordinary vivid impression that the cardinal was laughing. He looked up quickly, only to behold Luigi Capriola calm and grave. A peal of thunder sounded, and the echoes hovered in the chamber. The confession must come before the absolution, said the cardinal. Tell me, my son, what troubles you? Thierry shuddered. It involves others than myself. The seal of the confession is sacred, and I will ask for no names. Thierry of Dendermonde, kneel here and confess. He pointed to the ivory footstool close to his raised seat. Thierry came and humbly knelt. The curtains fluttered in the hot wind. A flash of lightning darted in between them and mingled with the luminous color cast by the faint lamps. The cardinal took up the gold book and laid it on his knee. His pink silk sleeve almost touched Thierry's lips. His garments gave out a strange and beautiful perfume. Tell me of these sins of thine, he said, half under his breath. I must go far back, answered the penitent in a trembling voice, for your eminence to understand my sins. They had small beginnings. He paused and fixed his gaze on the cardinal's long, fair fingers resting across the gold cover of the breviary. I was born in Dendermonde, he said at last. My father was a clerk who taught me his learning. When he died, I came to Courtraig. I was eighteen, ambitious, and clever beyond other scholars of my age. I wished above everything to go to one of the colleges. To gain a living, I taught the arts I was acquainted with. Among others, I gave lessons in music to a daughter of a great lord in Courtraig. In this manner, I came to know her brother, who was a young knight of lusty desires. He was, as I, restless and impatient with Courtrai, but, unlike me, he was innocent, for I, he moistened his lips, I, about this time, began to practice black magic. Black magic, repeated the cardinal. Go on. I read forbidden books that I found in an old library in the house of a Jew whose son I taught. I tried to work spells, to raise spirits, I was very desperate to better myself. I wished to become as Alcun, as St. Jerome, nay, as Zerdusht himself. But I was not skillful enough. I could do little or nothing. The young knight I have spoken of was in love with a mighty lady who came through Courtraig. He wished to follow her to Frankfurt. She had given him hopes that she would find him service there. He asked me to bear him company and I was glad to go. On the journey he told me of his marriage to the daughter of a neighboring lord, and, although it is no matter here, he knew not if she were alive or dead, but he knew of the place where she had last been known of, and we went thither. 
It was in the old, half-deserted town of Antwerp. We found the house, and there we met a youth, who told us of the maid's death, and showed us her grave. "'What of this youth?' asked the cardinal, softly. "'Tell me of him.' "'He ruined me. By night he came to me, and told me of his studies. Black magic! Black magic! He cast spells, and raised a devil. In a mirror he showed me visions. I swore with him faithful friendship. He ruined my soul. He sold some of the goods in the house, and we went together to Baal College. He was high-born, I think, dainty in his ways and pleasant to look upon. My faltering soul was caught by his wiles, for he spoke of great rewards. I know not who he was, man or demon. I think he loved me. There was a little silence in the chamber. Then the cardinal spoke. Loved you? What makes you think he loved you? Certes, he said so, and acted so. We went to Bal College. Then I also thought I loved him. He was the only thing in the world I had ever spoken to of my hopes, my desires. We continued our experiments. Our researches were blasphemous, horrible. He was ever more skillful than I. Then one day I met a lady and then I knew myself hideous, but that very night I was drawn into the toils again. We cast a spell over another student. We were discovered and fled the college. A flash of lightning pierced the blue gloom like a sword rending silk. Thierry winced and shuddered as the thunder crashed overhead. Does your tale end here? demanded the cardinal. Alas! Alas, no! I fell from worse sin to worse sin. We were poor. We met a monk, robbed him of God his money, and left him for dead. We came to Frankfurt and lived in the house of an Egyptian hag, and I began to loathe the youth because the lady was ever in my thoughts, and he hated the lady bitterly because of this. He tempted me to do murder for gain, and I refused for her sake. Thierry's voice became hot and passionate. Then I found that he was tempting her, my saint, but I had no fear that she would fall, and while she spurned him, I thought I could also. Ay, and I did. But she proved no stronger. She loved her steward and bid him slay his wife. You staked on her virtue, the devil cried to me, and you've lost, lost! The sobs thickened his voice, and the bitter tears gathered in his beautiful eyes. I was the youth's prey again, but now I hated him for his victory. We came back to Frankfurt, and he was sweet and soft to me, while I was thinking how I might injure him as he had injured me. I dwelt on that picture of her, dishonored and undone, and I hated him, so waited my chance and the night we reached the city, I betrayed him for what he was, betrayed him to whom I had sworn friendship. Well, half the town came howling through the snow to seize him, but we were too late. We found a flaming house, it burnt to ashes, he with it. I had had my revenge, but it brought me no peace. I left the west and went to the east, to India, Persia, to Greece. I avoided both God and the devil. I dreaded hell and dared not hope for heaven. I tried to forget, but could not. I tried to repent, but could not. Good and evil strove for me until the Lord had pity. I heard of you, and I have come to Rome to cast myself at your feet, to ask your aid to help throw myself on God his mercy. God wins, I think, this time, he continued in an unsteady voice. I have confessed my sins. I will do penance for them and die at least in peace. God and the angels win. The cardinal rose. With one hand he held to the back of the ivory chair. With the other he clasped the golden book to his breast, the light shining on his red hair 
showed it in filmy brightness against the wall of ebony and mother of pearl. His face and lips were very pale above the vivid hue of his robe. His eyes, large and dark, stared at Thierry. Again the lightning flashed between the two and seemed to sink into the floor at the cardinal's feet. He lifted his head proudly and listened to the following mighty roll. When the echoes had quivered again into hot stillness, he spoke. The devil and his legions win, I think, he said. At least they have served Dirk Renswold well. Thierry fell back and back until he crouched against the gleaming wall. Cardinal Capriola, he cried fearfully. Cardinal Capriola, speak to me. Even here I hear the fiend's jibe. The cardinal stepped from the ebony dais, his stiff robes making a rustling as he walked. He laughed. <laughs> Have I learned a mean so holy my old comrade knows me not? Have I changed so? I, who was dainty and pleasant to look upon, your friend and your bane? He paused in the center of the room. The open window, the dark behind it, the waving curtains, the fierce lightning made a terrific background for his haughty figure. But Thierry moaned and whispered in his throat. Look at me, commanded the cardinal. Look at me well, you who betrayed me. Am I not he who gilded a devil one August afternoon in a certain town in Flanders? Thierry drew himself up and pressed his clenched hands to his temples. Betrayed, he shrieked. It is I who am betrayed. I sought God and have been delivered unto the devil. The thunder crashed so that his words were lost in the great noise of it. The blue and forked lightning darted between them. You know me now? asked the cardinal. Thierry slipped to his knees, crying like a child. Where is God? Where is God? The cardinal smiled. He is not here he answered, nor in any place where I have been. An awful stillness fell after the crash of thunder. Thierry hid his face, cowering like a man who feels his back bared to the lash. Cannot you look at me? asked the cardinal in a half mournful scorn. After all these years am I to meet you, thus, at my feet? Thierry sprang up, his features mask-like in their unnatural distortion and lifeless hue. You do well to taunt me, he answered, for I am an accursed fool. I have been seeking for what does not exist, God. Ay, now I know that there is no God and no heaven. Therefore, what matter for my soul? What matter for any of it since the devil owns us all? Your soul, cried the cardinal, as before. Always have you thought too much and not enough of that. You served too many masters, and not one faithfully. Had you been a stronger man, you had stayed with your fallen saint, not spurned her and then avenged her by my betrayal. He crossed to the window and closed it, the while the lightning picked him out in a fierce flash, and waited until the aftercrash had rocked to silence his eyes all the while not leaving the shrinking, horror-stricken figure of Thierry. Well, it is a long while ago, he said, and I and you have changed. How did you escape that night? asked Thierry hoarsely. The master, I serve, is powerful, smiled the cardinal. He saved me then, and set me where I am now, the greatest man in Rome, so great a man that did you wish a second time to betray me, you might shout the truth in the streets and find no one to believe you. Betray you, cried Thierry, wild-eyed. No, I bow the knee to the greatest thing I have met, and kiss your hand, your eminence. The cardinal turned and looked at him over his shoulder. I never broke my vows, he said softly the vows of comradeship I made to you. Just now you said you thought I loved you. Then, I mean, in the old days. He paused and his delicate hand crept over his heart. Well, I loved you, 
and it ruined me as the devils promised. Last night I was warned that you would come today and that you would be my bane. Well, I do not care, since you are come, for, sir, I love you still. Dirk, cried Thierry, do you suppose it matters to me that you are weak, foolish, or that you betrayed me? You are the one thing in all the world I care for. Love, what was your love when you left her at Sebastian's feet? Had she been my lady, I had stayed and laughed at all of it. It is not the devil who has taught you to be so faithful, said Thierry. For the first time a look of trouble, almost of despair, came into the cardinal's eyes. He turned his head away. You shame me, continued Thierry. I have no constancy in me, thinking of my own soul. Almost have I forgotten Jacobia of Martzburg. And yet... And yet you loved her. Maybe I did. It is long ago. A bitter smile curved the cardinal's lips. Is that the way men care for women, he said. Certes, not in that manner had I wooed and remembered, had I been a, a lover. Strange that we, meeting here like this, should talk of love, cried Thierry, his heart heaving, his eyes dilating. Strange that I, driven round the world by fear of God, that I, coming here to one of God's own saints, should find myself in the devil's net again. Come, he has done much for you. What will he do for me? The cardinal smiled sadly. Neither God nor devil will do anything for you, for you are not single-hearted, neither constant to good nor evil. But I will risk everything to serve your desires. Thierry laughed. Heaven has cast the world away, and we are mad. You, you, famous as a holy man, did you murder the young Blay? I will back to India, to the east, and die an idol worshipper. See yonder crucifix, it hangs upon your walls. But the Christ does not rise to smite you. You handle the holy mysteries in the church, and no angel slays you on the altar steps. Let me away from Rome. He turned to the gilt door, but the cardinal caught his sleeve. Stay, he said, stay, and all I promise you in the old days shall come true. Do you doubt me? Look about you. See what I have won for myself. Nay, let me go. The last rumble of the thunder crossed their speech. Stay, and I will make you emperor. Oh, devil, cried Thierry, can you do that? We will rule the world between us. Yea, I will make you emperor, if you will stay in Rome and serve me. I will snatch the diadem from Balthasar's head, and cast his empress out as I ever meant to do. And you shall bear the scepter of the Caesars. Oh, my friend, my friend! He held out his right hand as he spoke. Thierry caught it, crushed the fingers in his hot grasp, and kissed the brilliant rings. The cardinal flushed and dropped his lids over sparkling eyes. You will stay, he breathed. Yea, my sweet fiend, I am yours and wholly yours. Lo, were not rewards such as these better worth crossing the world for than a pardon from God? He laughed and staggered back against the wall, his look dazed and reckless. The cardinal withdrew his hand and crossed to the ivory seat. Now, farewell, he said. The audience has been over long. I know where to find you, and in a while I shall send for you. Farewell, O Thierry of Dendermonde. Farewell, O disciple of Satanas. I, your humble follower, shall look for fulfillment of your promises. When Luigi Capriola was alone, he put his hand over his eyes and swayed backwards as if about to fall, while his breath came in tearing pants. With an effort he steadied himself, and clenching his hands now over his heart, paced up and down the room his cardinal's robes trailing after him, his golden rosary glittering against his knee. 
as he struggled for control the gilt door was opened and paolo orsini bowed himself into his presence a messenger has just come from the vatican my lord ah his holiness was found dead in his sleep an hour ago your eminence the cardinal paled and fixed his burning eyes on the secretary thank you orsini i thought he would not last the spring well we must watch the conclave he moved his handkerchief from his mouth and twisted it in his fingers the secretary was taking his dismissal when the cardinal recalled him orsini it is desirable we should have an audience with the empress she has many creatures in the church who must be brought to heal write to her orsini i will my lord the young man withdrew and luigi capriola stood very still staring at the gleaming walls of his gorgeous cabinet. End of section 24. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 25 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 3 The Empress. Isabeau, wife of Balthasar of Courtrai, an empress of the west waited in the porphyry cabinet of cardinal capriola she sat on a low chair by the window and rested her chin on her hand her superb eyes were grave and thoughtful she did not move from her reflective attitude during the time the haughty priest kept her waiting when at last he entered with a shimmer and ripple of purple silks she rose and bent her head it pleases you to make me attendant on your pleasure my lord she said cardinal capriola gave her calm greeting my time is not my own he added god his service comes first lady the empress returned to her seat have i come here to discuss god with your eminence she asked and her fair mouth was scornful the cardinal crossed to the far end of the cabinet and slowly took his place on his carved gold chair it is of ourselves we will speak he said smiling certes your grace will have expected that nay she answered what is there we have in common cardinal capriola ambition said his eminence which is known alike to saint and sinner isabeau looked at him swiftly he was smiling with lips and eyes sitting back with an air of ease and power that discomposed her she had never liked him. If your talk be of policy, my lord, it is to the emperor you should go. I think you have as much influence in Rome as your husband, my daughter. It is our influence you wish, my lord, certes, a matter for the emperor. Yea, you understand me. Your eminence desires our support in the conclave now sitting, she continued haughtily. But have you ever shown so much duty to us that we should wish to see you in St. Peter's seat? She thought herself justified in speaking thus to a man whose greatness had always galled her, for she saw in this appeal for her help an amazing confession of weakness on his part. But Luigi Capriola remained entirely composed. You have your creatures in the church, he said, and you intend one of them to wear the tiara. There are sixteen cardinals in the conclave, and I, perhaps, have half of them. Your grace, you must see that your faction does not interfere with what these priests desire, my election, namely. Must, she repeated, her violet eyes dilating. Your eminence has some reputation as a holy man, and you suggest the corruption of the conclave. The cardinal leant forward in his chair. I do not play for a saintly fame, he said, and as for a corrupted conclave, your grace should know corruption, seeing that your art, and your art alone, achieved the election of Balthasar to the German throne. Isabeau stared at him mutely. He gave a soft laugh. <laughs> you are a clever woman, he continued. Your husband is the first king of the Germans to hold the Empire of the West for ten years and keep his heel on the homelands as well. But even your wits will scarcely suffice now. Bohemia revolts, 
and basil stretches greedy fingers from ravenna and to keep the throne secure you desire a man in the vatican who is balthasar's creature the empress rose and placed her hand on the gilded ribbing of the window frame your eminence shows some understanding she flashed pale beneath her paint we gained the west and we will keep the west so you see my lord why my influence will be against you not with you in the conclave your grace speaks boldly you think me your enemy you declare yourself hostile my lord nay i may be a good friend to you in st peter's she smiled the conclave have not declared their decision yet your eminence you are a great prince but the imperial party have some power the cardinal sat erect and his intense eyes quelled her despite herself some power which i ask you to exert in my behalf she looked away though angry with herself that his gaze overawed her you have declared your ambition my lord your talents and your wealth we know you are too powerful already for us to tolerate you as master in rome again you speak boldly smiled the cardinal perhaps too boldly i think you will yet help me to the tiara isabeau gave a quick glance at his pale handsome face framed in the red hair do you seek to bribe me my lord she remembered the vast riches of this man and their own empty treasury nay said luigi capriola still smiling i threaten threaten i threaten that i will make you an outcast in the streets unless you serve me well she was the tiger cat now ready to turn at bay marosia porphyrogenitis of byzantium i know that of you said the cardinal that once revealed would make the emperor hurl you from his side she sucked in her breath and waited melchoir of brabant died by poison and by witchcraft all the world knows that her eyes were long and evil he was bewitched by a young doctor of frankfort college who perished for the deed the cardinal looked down at the hand on his lap yea that young doctor brewed the potion you administered it isabeau took a step forward into the room you lie i am not afraid of you you lie most utterly luigi capriola sprang to his feet silence woman speak not so to me it is the truth and i can prove it the cardinal still stood and dominated her do you recall a youth who was scrivener to your chamberlain and friend of the young doctor of rhetoric thierry his name born of dandermonde yea he is now dead or in the east he is alive and in rome he served you well once empress when he came to betray his friend and you were quick to seize the chance it suited him then to truckle to you i think he was afraid of you he is not now he knows and if i bid him he will speak isabeau answered swiftly i am not of a nation easily cowed my lord nor are the people of my blood readily trapped i can tear your reputed saintship to rags by spreading abroad this tale of how you tried to bargain with me for the popedom the cardinal smiled in a way she did not care to see but first i say to the emperor your wife slew your friend that she might be your wife your friend melchoir of brabant you loved him better than you loved the woman will you not avenge him now the empress pressed her clenched hands against her heart and with an effort raised her eyes to her accuser's masterful face my lord's love against it all she said hoarsely he knows melchoir's murderer perished in frankfort in the flames he knows that i am innocent and he will laugh at you weave what tissues of falsehood you will sir i do defy you and will do no bargaining to set you in the vatican the cardinal rested his fingertips on the arm of the chair and looked down at them with a deepening smile you speak he answered as one whom i can admire 
it requires great courage to put the front you do on guilt but i have certain knowledge of what i say come i will prove to you that you cannot deceive me you came first to the house of a certain witch in frankfort on a day in august a youth opened the door and took you into a room at the back that looked on to a garden growing dark red roses you knew that he had been driven from bow college for witchcraft even as i know you compassed the death of your first husband and you asked him to help you even as i ask you to help me now the cardinal reseated himself in his gold chair and marked with brilliant merciless eyes the woman struggling to make a stand against him hugh of rousselary died he said with sudden venom died basely for justly accusing you and so shall you die basely unless you aid me in the conclave cardinal capriola she said you ask me to use my influence to bring about your election to the popedom knowing you as i know you now i cannot fail to see you are a man who would stop at naught if i help you i shall help my husband's enemy once you are in the vatican how long will you tolerate him in rome you will be no man's creature and i think no man's ally what chance shall we have in rome once you are master sylvester was old and meek he let balthasar hold the reins will you do that that i will not said luigi capriola if it please me i will hurl him down and set one of my own followers up i have no love for balthasar of courtraig isabeau's face hardened with hate but you think he can help you to the tiara through you lady you can tell him i am his friend his ally what you will or you may directly influence the cardinals i care not so the thing be done what i shall do if it be not done i have said then you are wrong neither threats nor bribery can make me do this thing say what you will to the emperor i am secure in his good affections blight my fame and turn him against me if you can i am not so mean a woman that fear can make me betray the fortunes of my husband and my son the cardinal lowered his eyes he was very pale you dare death he said a shameful death if my accusation be proved as proved it shall be the empress looked at him over her shoulder dare death she cried you say i have dared hell for him shall i be afraid then of paltry death luigi capriola's breast heaved beneath the vivid silk of his robe of what are you afraid he asked of nothing save evil to my lord the cardinal's lids dropped he moistened his lips this is your answer yea your eminence all the power i possess shall go to prevent you mounting the throne you covet so and now seeing you have that answer i will leave my courtiers grow weary in your halls she moved to the door as she opened it the cardinal turned his head give me a little longer your grace he said softly i have yet something to say she reclosed the door and stood with her back against it well my lord the cardinal was pale and scornful his narrow eyes and curving mouth expressed bitterness and passion here is the weapon that shall bring you to your knees he said and make your boasting die upon your lips you are not the wife of balthasar and the only heritage your son will ever have is the shame and weariness of the outcast not his wife why you rave we were married before all frankfort not balthasar's wife your lord was wed before yea i know what of it this ursula of rousselary lives ursula of rousselary died in antwerp she cried wildly in the convent of the white sisters she did not 
and balthasar knows she did not he thinks she died thereafter he thinks he saw her grave but he would find it empty she lives she is in rome and she is his wife his empress before god and man how do you know this she made a last pitiful attempt to brave him but the terrible cardinal had broken her strength the horror of the thing he said had chilled her blood and choked her heartbeats the youth who helped you once the doctor constantine from him balthasar obtained the news of his wife's death for ursula and he were apprenticed to the same old master ask balthasar if this be not so well the youth lied for purposes of his own the maid lived then and is living now and if i choose it she will speak it is not possible shuddered the empress no you wish to drive me mad and so you torture me why did not this woman speak before the cardinal smiled she did not love her husband as you do lady and so preferred her liberty you should be grateful she has his ring and her wedding deeds signed by him and by the priest there are those at rousselary who know her albeit it is near twenty years since she was there also she hath the deposition of old master lucas that she was a supposed nun when she came to him and in reality the wife of balthasar of courtraig she can prove no one lies buried in the garden of master lucas's house and she can bring forward sisters of the order to which she belonged to show that she did not die on her wedding day this and further proof can she show she must be silenced by christus his mother she must be silenced secure me the casting vote in the conclave and she will never speak i have said i cannot for his sake for my son's sake then i will bring forth ursula of rousselary and she shall prove herself the emperor's wife then instantly you must leave him or both of you will be excommunicated your alternative will be to stay and be his ruin or go to obscurity never seeing his face again your son will no longer be king of the romans but a nameless wanderer spurned and pitied by those who should be his subjects and another woman will sit by balthasar's side on the throne of the west for a little while she was silent and the cardinal also as he looked at her then she raised her eyes to meet his steadily now she kept them at the level of his gaze and her base bold blood served her well in the manner of her speech lord cardinal she said you have won before you as before the world i stand balthasar's wife nor can you fright me from that proud station by telling of this impostor yet i am afraid of you i dare not come to an issue with you luigi capriola and to buy your silence on these matters i will secure your election and afterwards you and my lord shall see who is the stronger we part as enemies he answered but i kiss the hem of your gown empress for you are brave as you are beautiful he gracefully lifted the purple robe to his lips and above all things do i admire a constant woman his voice was strangely soft she moved away steadying her steps with difficulty the two chamberlains in the antechamber rose as she stepped out of the cabinet benedictus my daughter smiled the cardinal and closed the door how she loves him still he said aloud yet why do i wonder is he not as fair a man as he broke off then added reflectively also she is beautiful his long fingers felt among his silk robes he drew forth a little mirror and gazed at his handsome face with the darkened upper lip and tonsured head as he looked he smiled then presently laughed end of section twenty five recording by molly craig
Section 26 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 4, The Dancer in Orange. Thierry walked slowly through the gorgeous ruins of Imperial Rome. It was something afternoon and glowingly hot. The Tiber curled in and about the stone houses and broken palaces like a bronze and golden serpent, so smooth and glittering it was. He followed the river until it wound round the base of Mount Aventine, and there he paused and looked up at the Emperor's palace, set splendidly on the hill. A little Byzantine chariot, gilt with azure curtains and drawn by a white horse, came towards him. The occupant was a lady in a green dress. The grooms ran either side of the horse's head to assist it up the hill. The chariot passed Thierry at a walking pace. The lady was unveiled, and the sun was full on her face. It was Jacobia of Martzburg. She did not see him. Her car continued its slow way towards the palace, and Thierry stood staring after it. He had last seen her ten years and more ago in her steward's arms in the courtyard of Castle Martzburg, beyond them Sebastian's wife. The sound of cymbals and laughter roused him from his agitated thoughts. He looked along the road that wound by the Tiber and saw a little crowd approaching, evidently following a troop of jugglers or mountebanks. As they came nearer to where he loitered, Thierry, ever easily attracted by any passing excitement or attraction, could not choose but give them a half-sullen attention. The center of the group was a girl in an orange gown, they who followed her the mere usual citizens of Rome, some courtiers of the emperors, soldiers, merchants' clerks, and the rabble of children, lazy mongrel foreigners and franks. The dancer stopped, and spread a scarlet carpet on the roadway. The crowd gathered about in a circle, and Thierry drew up with the rest, interested by what interested them. The two facts, namely, that marked the girl as different from her kind. Firstly, she affected the unusual modesty or coquetry of a black mask that completely covered her face. And secondly, she was attended only by a hideous ape, Although the mask concealed the charms of her face, it was obvious that she was young, and probably Greek. Her figure was tall, full, and splendidly graceful. She held a pair of brass cymbals and struck them with a stormy joyousness above her proud head. The ape, wearing a collar of bright red stones and a long blue jacket trimmed with spangles, curled himself on the corner of the carpet and went to sleep. The girl began dancing. She had no music save her cymbals, and needed none. Suddenly she lowered the cymbals, struck them together before her breast, and looked from right to left. Thierry caught the gleam of her dark eyes through the holes in her mask. For a while she crouched together, panting, then drew herself erect and let her hands fall apart. The burning sun shone in her hair in the metal hems of her robe, in her sandals, and changed the cymbals into discs of fire. She began to sing. Her voice was deep and glorious, though muffled by the mask. Slowly she moved round the red carpet, and the words of her song fell clearly on the hot air. If love were all his perfect servant I would be, kissing where his foot might fall, doing him homage on a lowly knee if love were all if love were all and no such thing as pride nor empery nor god nor sins or great or small if love were all she passed thierry so close her fluttering robe touched his slack hand he looked at her curiously for he thought he knew her voice he had heard many women sing, and somewhere this one. If love were all, but love is weak, 
and hate oft giveth him a fall and wisdom smites him on the cheek if love were all if love were all and i had lived glad and meek nor heard ambition call and valor speak if love were all the song ended as it had begun on a clash of cymbals the dancer swung round stamped her foot and called fiercely to the ape who leapt up and began running round the crowd offering a shell and making an ugly jabbering noise thierry flung the hideous thing a silver besant and moved away he was thinking not of the dancer with the unknown memory in her voice but of the lady in the gilt chariot behind the azure curtains jacobia how little she had changed a burst of laughter made him look round he saw a quick picture the girl's orange dress flashing in the strong sunlight the ape on her shoulder hurling the contents of the shell in the air which glittered for a second with silver pieces and the jesting crowd closing round both he passed on moodily into the centre of the town in the unrest and agitation of his thoughts he had determined to seek cardinal capriola since the cardinal gave no sign of sending for him even of remembering him but to-day it was useless to journey to the palace on the palatine for the conclave sat in the vatican and the cardinal would be of their number the streets the wine shops the public squares were full of a mixed and excited mob the adherents of the emperor who wished to see a german pontiff and they who were ardent romans or churchmen came here and there to open brawls the endless processions that crossed and recrossed from the various monasteries and churches were interrupted by the lawless jeers of the frankish inhabitants who under a strong emperor and a weak pope had begun to assume the bearing of conquerors thierry left them all too concerned as always in his own small affairs to have any interest in larger issues he turned into the via sacra and there under the splendid but broken arch of constantine he saw again the dancing girl and her ape she looked at him intently of that he could have no doubt despite her mask and as he turned his hesitating steps toward the palatine she rose and followed him as he ascended the narrow gray road that wound above the city he kept looking over his shoulder and she was always there following with the ape on her shoulder they passed scattered huts monasteries decaying temples and villas and came out on to the deserted stretches of the upper palatine where the fragmentary glories of another world lay under the cypress and olive trees here thierry paused and again looked half fearfully for the bright figure of the dancer she stood not far from him leaning against a slender shaft of marble the sole remaining column of a temple to some heathen god thierry flung himself on a low marble seat that stood in the shade of a cypress and his blood-red robe was vivid even in the shadow he looked at the veiled city at his feet and at the dancing girl resting against the time-stained moss-grown column she loosened the symbols from her hands and flung them on the ground the ape jumped from her shoulder and caught them up again she sang her passionate little song as she sang another and very different scene was suddenly brought to thierry's mind he remembered a night when he had slept on the edge of a pine forest in germany many years ago and had suddenly awoke nay he had dreamt he heard singing and a woman singing if it were not so mad a thought he would have said this woman singing he turned bitter dark eyes towards her why had she followed him swiftly and lightly she came across the grass glittering from head to foot in the sunlight and paused before him certes you should be in rome to-day she said the conclave come to their decision this afternoon do you wish to hear it announced from the vatican nay smiled thierry i would rather see you dance her answer was mocking 
you care nothing for my dancing i would wager to stir any man in rome sooner than you thierry flushed why did you follow me he asked in a half indifferent dislike she seated herself on the other end of his marble bench my reasons are better than my dancing and would could i speak them have more effect on you she leant towards him across the length of the bench and the perfume of her orange garments mingled with the odor of the violets take me for something other than what i appear she continued in a mournful and passionate voice in being here i risk an unthinkable fate i stake the proudest hopes the fairest fortune who are you cried thierry why are you masked she drew back instantly and her tone changed to scorn again when there are many pilgrims in rome the monks bid us poor fools wear masks lest with our silly faces we lure souls away from god thierry was silent the dancing girl laughed softly are you thinking of her she asked he turned with a start thinking of whom he demanded the lady in the byzantine chariot jacobia of martzburg he sprang up who are you and what do you know of me this at least that you have not forgotten her yet you would be emperor too would you not ye are some witch he said i come from thessaly where we have skill in magic she answered and now she sat erect her yellow dress casting a glowing reflection into the marble and i tell you this she added passionately if you would be emperor let that woman be she will do naught for you let her go this is a warning thierry of dendermonde his face flushed his eyes sparkled have i a chance of wearing the imperial crown he cried may i i rule the west tell me that witch she whistled the ape on her side i am no witch but i warn you to think no more of jacobia of martzburg he answered hotly i love not to hear her name on your tongue she is nothing to me i need not your warning the dancer rose for your own sake forget her thierry of dendermonde and you may be indeed emperor of the west and caesar of the romans how came you by your knowledge he asked and clutched the cypress trunk i read your fortune in your eyes she answered we in thessaly have skill in these things as i have said look at the city beneath us is it not worth much to reign in it the gold vapour that lay about the distant hills seemed to be resolving into heavy menacing clouds thierry following the direction of her slender pointing finger gazed at the city and saw the clouds beyond a storm gathers he said and knew not why he shivered suddenly until his pearl earrings tinkled on the collar round his neck the dancer laughed wildly and musically come with me to the piazza of st peter she said and you shall hear strange words with that she caught hold of his blood-red garments and drew him towards the city as they went down the road that wound through the glorious desolation thierry heard the sound of pattering feet and looked over his shoulder it was the ape who followed them he walked on his hind legs how tall he was thierry had not thought him so large nor of such a human semblance the dancer was silent and thierry could not speak when they entered the city gates the dun-coloured clouds had swallowed up the gold vapour and half covered the sky as they crossed the tiber and neared the vatican the last beams of the sun disappeared under the shadow of the oncoming storm enormous crowds were gathered in the piazza of st peter it seemed as if all rome had assembled there many faces were turned towards the sky and the sudden gloom that had overspread the city seemed to infect the people for they were mostly silent even sombre the enormous and terrible ape cleared an easy way for himself through the crowd and thierry and the dancing girl followed until they had pushed through the press of people 
and found themselves under the windows of the Vatican. I cannot see, she said, not even the window. He, with an instinct to assist her, and an impulse to use his strength, caught her round the waist and lifted her up. For a second her breast touched his. He felt her heart beating violently behind her thin robe, and an extraordinary sensation took possession of him, occasioned by the touch of her, the sense of her in his arms. There was communicated, as if from her heart to his, a high and rapturous passion. It was the most terrible and the most splendid feeling he had ever known. At once an agony and a delight, such as he had never dreamed of before. Unconsciously he gave an exclamation and loosened his hold. She slipped to the ground with a stifled and miserable cry. Let me alone, she said wildly. Let me alone. Who are you? he whispered excitedly and tried to catch hold of her again. But the great ape came between them and the seething crowd roughly pushed him. Cardinal Maria Orsini had stepped out on to one of the balconies of the Vatican. He looked over the expectant crowd, then up at the black and angry sky, and seemed for a moment to hesitate. When he spoke, his words fell into a great stillness. The sacred college has elected a successor to St. Peter in the person of Louis of Dendermonde, abbot of the Brethren of the Sacred Heart in Paris, Bishop of Ostia, and Cardinal Capriola, who will ascend the papal throne under the name of Michael II. He finished. The cries of triumph from the Romans, the yells of rage from the Franks, were drowned in a sudden and awful peal of thunder. The lightning darted across the black heavens and fell on the Vatican and Castel San Angelo. The clouds were rent in two behind the temple of Mars the Avenger, and a thunderbolt fell with a hideous crash into the forum of Augustus. Thierry, whipped with terror, turned with the frightened crowd to flee. He heard the dancing girl laugh and tried to snatch at her orange garments, but she swept by him and was lost in the surge. Rome quivered under the onslaught of the thunder, and the lightning alone lit the murky, hot gloom. The reign of the Antichrist has begun, shrieked Thierry, and laughed insanely. End of section 26. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 27 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Chapter 5. The Pope. The chamber in the Vatican was so dimly, richly lit with jeweled and deep-colored lamps, that at first Thierry thought himself alone. He looked round and saw silver walls hung with tapestries of violet and gold, pillars with columns of sea-green marble and capitals of shining mosaic supported a roof encrusted with jasper and jade. The floor of Numidian marble was spread with Indian silk carpets, here and there stood crystal bowls of roses, white and crimson, fainting in the close, sweet air. At the far end of the room was a dais, and Thierry, as his eyes became used to the wine-colored gloom, saw that someone sat there, someone so splendidly robed and so still that it seemed more like one of the images Thierry had seen worshipped in Constantinople than a human being. He shivered. Presently he could discern intense eyes looking at him out of a dazzle of dark gold and shimmering shadowed colors. Michael the Second moved in his seat. "'You sent for me,' said Thierry. To himself his voice sounded hoarse and unnatural. "'At last!' "'At last?' "'I have been waiting.' You have been Pope thirty days, and never have you given me a sign. Is thirty days so long? You have done nothing for me. You spoke of favors. Favors, echoed Michael. You are the only man in Christendom who would stand in my presence. The emperor kneels to kiss my foot. The emperor does not know, shuddered Thierry. But I do, and knowing... 
I cannot kneel to you. Ah, God, how can you dare it? The Pope's soft voice came from the shadows. Your moods change, first this, then that. What humor are you in now, Thierry of Dendermonde? Would you still be emperor? Thierry put his hand to his brow. Yea, you know it. Why do you torture me with suspense, with waiting? If evil is to be my master, let me serve him and be rewarded. The Pope held back the blossom-strewn brocade so that he could see the other's face. I ask of you to let Jacobia of Martzburg be. Thierry flushed. How ye have always hated her. Since I came to Rome, I have seen her the once. The Pope's smooth, pale face showed a stain of red from the dim beams of one of the splendid lamps. Thierry observed it as he leant forward. She did not marry her steward, he said. The Pope's eyes narrowed. Ye have been at the pains to discover that? Thierry laughed mournfully. You have won. You, sitting where you sit now, can afford to mock at me, at my love, at my hope, both of which I placed once at stake on her, and lost, and lost, ten years ago, but having again seen her, sometimes I must think of her, and that she was not vile after all, but only trapped by you, as I have been. Sebastian went to Palestine, and she has gone unwed. The Pope gave a quick sigh and bit his lip. I will make you emperor, he said, but that woman shall not be your empress. Did I love her even, which I do not, I would put her gladly aside to sit on the imperial throne. Come, I have dallied long enough on the brink of devilry. Let me sin grandly now, and be grandly paid. Michael the Second gave so quick a breath the jewels on his breast scattered colored light. Come nearer to me, he commanded, and take my hand, as you used to in Frankfurt. I am always Dirk to you, you who never cared for me, hated me, I think. Oh, the traitors our hearts are! Neither God nor devil is so fierce to fight. Thierry approached the gold steps. The Pope leant down and gave him his cool white hand, heavy with gemmed rings, and looked intently into his eyes. When they announced your election, how the storm smote the city, whispered Thierry fearfully. Were you not daunted? The Pope withdrew his hand. I was not in the conclave, he said, in a strange tone. I lay sick in my villa. As for the storm... It has not lifted since, breathed Thierry. Day and night have the clouds hung over Rome. Is not there, after all, a god? Silence, cried the Pope in a troubled voice. You would be emperor of the West, would you not? Let us speak of that. Thierry leant against the arm of the throne and stared with an awful fascination into the other's face. Eh, let us speak of that, he answered wildly. Can all your devilries accomplish it? It is common talk in Rome that you secured your election by Frankish influence because you vowed to league with Balthasar. They say you are his ally. Nevertheless, I will cast him down and set you in his place. He comes today to ask my aid against Lombardy and Bohemia, and therefore I have sent for you that you may overhear this audience and see how I mate and checkmate an emperor for your sake. As he spoke, he pointed to the other end of the room, where hung a somber and rich curtain. Conceal yourself behind that tapestry, and listen carefully to what I say, and you will understand how I may humble Balthasar and shake him from his throne. Thierry, not joyous nor triumphant, but agitated and trembling with a horrible excitement, crept across the room and passed silently behind the arras. As the long folds shook into place again, the Pope touched a bell. Paolo Orsini entered. Admit the Emperor! The secretary withdrew. There was a soft sound in the antechamber, the voices of priests. A heavy tread sounded without, and the Emperor advanced into the splendid glooms of the audience chamber. 
he was bareheaded, and at sight of the awe-inspiring figure went on his knees at the foot of the dais. Michael II looked at him in silence. The silver door was closed, and they were alone, save for the unseen listener behind the arras. At last the Pope said slowly, Arise, my son. The Emperor stood erect, showing his magnificent height and bearing. Your Holiness knows that it is my humble desire to form a firm alliance between Rome and Germany. I have ruled both long enough to prove myself neither weak nor false. I have ever been a faithful servant of Holy Church. Michael II smiled. On what right does your grace presume when you ask us to aid you in steadying a trembling throne? I was assured, Holy Father, of your friendliness before the election. The Empress... Again the Pope cut him short. Cardinal Capriola was not the vicerent of Christ, the high priest of Christendom, as we are now, and those whom Louis of Dendermonde knew became as nothing before the Pope of Rome in whose estimate all men are the same. "'Your Holiness can have no object in refusing my alliance,' he answered. "'Sylvester crowned me with his own hands, and I always lived in friendship with him. He aided me with troops when the Lombards rebelled against their suzerain, and Suabia he placed under an interdict. "'We are not Sylvester,' said the Pope haughtily nor accountable for his doings, as you may show yourself the obedient son of the church, so may we support you. Otherwise, we can denounce as we can uphold, pull down as we can raise up, and it wants but little, Balthasar of Courtraig, to shake your throne from under you. The emperor bit his lip, and the scales of his mail gleamed as they rose with his heavy breathing. He knew that if the power of the Vatican was placed on the side of his enemies, he was ruined. In what way have I offended your holiness? he asked, with what humility he could. Ye have offended heaven, for whom we stand, he answered, and until, by penitence, ye assoil your soul, we must hold you outcast from the mercies of the church. Tell me my sins, said Balthasar hoarsely, and what I can do to blot them out masses money lands none of these can make your peace with god and us only one thing can avail there tell it me cried the emperor eagerly if it be a crusade surely i will go after lombardy is subdued the pope flashed a quick glance over him we want no knight errantry in the east we demand this that you put away the woman whom you call your wife Balthasar stared with dilating eyes. St. Joris, guard us, he muttered, the woman whom I call my wife. Isabel, first wedded to the man whom you succeeded. I do not understand, your holiness. The Pope turned in his chair so that the lamplight made his robe one bright purple sheen. Come here, my lord. The emperor advanced to the gold steps. A slim, fair hand was held out to him, holding between finger and thumb a ring set with a deep red stone. Balthasar of Courtraig looked at the ring. Round the bezel, two coats of arms were delicately engraved in the soft red gold. Why, he said in a troubled way, I know the ring, yea, it was made many years ago. The woman to whom in your name it was given still lives. Ursula of Rousselary? cried Balthasar. Yea, Ursula of Rousselary, your wife. My first wife, who died before I had seen her, holiness, stammered the emperor. Who told you she was dead? continued the pope. A certain youth, who for his ends I think lied. A wicked youth he was, and he died in Frankfurt for compassing the death of the late emperor, or escaped that end by firing his house. The tale grows faint with years. Twas he who told you Ursula of Rousselary was dead, even showed you her grave, and you were content to take his word, and she was content to be silent. O oh, Christus! cried the emperor. O oh, Saint Joris! But Holy Father! This thing is impossible. He wrung his hands together, 
and beat his mailed breast. From whom had you this tale? From Ursula of Rousselary. It cannot be. Why was she silent all these years? Why did she allow me to take Isabeau to wife? A wild expression crossed the Pope's face. He looked beyond the Emperor with deep, soft eyes. Because she loved another man. A pause fell for a second. Then Michael II spoke again. I think, too, she something hated you who had failed her and scorned her. There was her father also, who died shamefully by Isabeau's command. She meant, I take it, to revenge that upon the Empress, and now perhaps her chance has come. Where is this woman who has so influenced your holiness against me? An impostor. Do not listen to her. She speaks the truth, as God and devils know, flashed the Pope and we, with all the weight of Holy Church, will support her in the maintenance of her just rights. We also have no love for this eastern woman who slew her lord. Nay, that is false, Balthasar ground his teeth. I know some said it of her, but it is a lie. This to me, cried the Pope, beware how ye anger God's vicerant. I bend my neck for your holiness to step on, so you do not ask me to listen to evil of the empress. Isabeau is not empress, nor your wife. Her son is not your heir, and you must presently part with both of them, or suffer the extremity of our wrath. Yea, the woman shall ye give into the hands of the executioner to suffer for the death of Melchoir, and the child shall ye turn away from you, and with pains and trouble shall ye search for Ursula of Rousselary, and finding her, cause her to be acknowledged your wife and empress of the West. That she lives, I know, the rest is for you. I have but one answer, said Balthasar, and it would be the same did I deliver it in the face of God, that while I live and have breath to speak, I shall proclaim Isabeau and none other as my wife, and our son as an empress's son, and my heir and successor, kingdom and even life may your holiness despoil me of, but neither the armies of the earth nor the angels of heaven shall take from me these two. This my answer to your holiness. The Pope resumed his seat. Ye dare to defy me, he said. Well, ye are a foolish man to set yourself against heaven. Go back and live in sin and wait the judgment. Balthasar's flesh crept and quivered, but he held his head high, even though the Pope's words opened the prospect of a sure hell. Michael II gazed at him in silence as he bent his head and backed towards the silver door. Presently he rose and descended from the dais. The dark heiress was lifted cautiously, and Thierry crept into the room. "'What you said was false?' whispered Thierry questioningly. The jewelled light flickered over the Pope's face. "'Nay, it was true. Ursula of Rousselary lives. I would like to see her. Who is it that she loves?' The Pope showed pale. He moved slowly across the room with his head bent. "'A man, for whose sake she puts her very life in jeopardy,' he said in a low, passionate voice. A man, I think, who is unworthy of her. The Pope lifted an arras that concealed an inner door. The first move is made, he said. Farewell now. I will acquaint you of the progress of your fortunes. He gave a slight, queer smile. As for Ursula of Rousselary, ye have seen her. Seen her? Yea, she wears the disguise of a masked dancer in orange. With that, he pointed Thierry to the concealed doorway and, turning, left him. End of section 27. Recording by Molly Craig.